Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our second week of Journalism Under Fire. I'm Sandy Campbell, the Executive Director of the Santa Fe Council on International Relations. Of course, we are now into new stay-at-home orders here in New Mexico. And let me offer our great sympathies and prayers for those who are sick, for those who are taking care of the sick, and of course, for the continued testing of a vaccine. It certainly seems like the two recent trials have a great promise. But of course, how we deliver the vaccine, especially in a place like New Mexico, is uh, something we'll be keenly watching and, and hoping for, uh, for all the best to, uh, to happen. So today we continue on our tour of the world with a stop in Russia or, or Latvia more specifically, where we find what has been called the home of Russia's free press. Um, and I hope a number of you joined us last night to listen to uh, Maria Ressa and Ramona Diaz talking. R Maria is just uh, one of the more inspiring journalists uh, and one of the more inspiring speakers, one of the more inspiring humans uh, that, that we've had the great pleasure of featuring. And, and I hope you, you enjoyed that. It is on our YouTube channel for those of you who missed it. Subscribe and you'll never miss a video. Uh, and it's on our, our website, journalismunderfire.org as well. Um, so on to today's panel. We have uh, a number of uh, folks here with us today. And Ivan Kopelkov, of course, was here last year uh, at Journal Journalism Under Fire and gave, I would say, easily one of the more memorable presentations. Welcome back to the Journalism Under Fire stage, Ivan. Good to see you. Hi, Sandy. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Always Good dreaming dream. about Santa Fe. <laughs> Good dreams, I hope. <laughs> and Terrific. And right next to Ivan, of course, is, uh, is uh, Ben Smith, the media columnist with the New York Times and the founding editor in chief of BuzzFeed News. Welcome, Ben. Thanks, Sandy. And today's moderator is Janet Steele. And you all may remember Janet from past uh, Journalism Under Fires, where she has been at both the 2018 and 2019 version. She's a professor of journalism and the director for the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communications at George Washington University and focuses on how culture is communicated through the mass media. Good morning. Good afternoon, Janet. Good morning. Oh, it's good afternoon here just now. So, and good evening to you, Yvonne, and uh, to anyone who's not in our time zone. <laughs> so Janet, quick question before I turn this over to you. You've come here a couple of times. What's one thing that's really sticks in your memory about uh, your experience in Santa Fe? Well, I had to laugh when I heard Donna Priest um, mention the dance party last year at the end. That was probably the most memorable. But in all honesty, for me, I'm a professor of journalism. I study, I'm not a journalist. I study how journalists think about their work. And so what could be more exciting than to spend a couple of weeks studying up on Yvonne and Ben and preparing questions that I hope will show your audience how extraordinary these journalists are. And so for me, it's just an incredible honor to get to, to read their work and think about their work and then try to think of ways that we, the three of us can have a good discussion that will hopefully bring something new to the table. I love doing it, invite me back. <laughs> Done, well, thank you for doing it. I'll turn everything over to you and folks, the Q and A um, panel is the place to ask your questions and we'll get to them towards the end of the presentation. Over to you, Janet. Okay, great. Thanks, Sandy. Well, this is this really is for me an extraordinary opportunity. And one of the things that is so interesting when Sandy gave me this assignment, and of course our topic is how to balance objectivity with the calls for change that fuel social protest and resistance. And we have two journalists here, I mean, two editors who have done just extraordinary work um, over the, say the past 10 years, even longer. They, of course, Ben Smith, the, um, the, the, the founder of BuzzFeed News, the editor-in-chief, um, uh, Yvonne, the editor-in-chief of Medusa, but they also have some interesting overlaps because Medusa and BuzzFeed are pretty similar and they had this cooperative agreement for a while. Um, and of course, um, uh, Medusa is, 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 is Russian, in independent Russian media, but it's situated in Riga, Latvia, and I found out, it's actually on his Wikipedia page, it didn't even take much digging, but Ben had lived in Latvia, and one of his first jobs was for the Baltic News. So, um, and he has quite a Latvian connection. So um, this was a very interesting parallel for me. Um, what I thought we'd do is, um, I think everybody knows about, probably most in the audience know about BuzzFeed News and about the New York Times, but Mendoza, um, for those who were not at the session last year, um, may, I, I thought it would be helpful to kind of do a little bit of basic stuff about Medusa. 
Um, Yvonne, you want to tell us again why, when, and why was Medusa created, and why is it in Latvia if it's Russian media? Oh well, <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Janet. Um, I always love to talk about Medusa. Um, so Medusa is um, a Russian media outlet in exile. It was uh, founded in uh, 2014, um, soon after the Crimea annexation, and uh, really soon after our team uh, had to leave the previous media outlet we've been working at. It was the biggest uh, news outlet, I think, uh, in Russian history. It was called Lenteru. Uh, so the owner fired our editor-in-chief in, in chief, and the whole team decided to, uh, to fire in support of uh, the editor. And- um, to resign, you mean? I'm to resign? Sorry? You, you yeah. resigned, everybody, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a massive event. It was really huge. And uh, it was also huge because the media outlet was really successful. So it was incredible that a lot of people, tens of people decided to leave this, to leave this place. And a um, small group of these people, um, and I was among them, we just you know, met to drink some beer and to cry about the uh, fortunes uh, of Russian journalism. And we realized that we don't want to quit from the profession, we want to make something else. And we started, the, started this um, very small at the beginning project in Latvia. You know, in, to, in 2014, I think it wouldn't be smart to start new political and social media outlet in Moscow. So that's why we decided to move to Latvia. It's really close to Russia. Uh, not many people know where Latvia is based, actually, but th it is a small country. It is post-Soviet country. It's like one hour flying from Moscow, and um, it is. But at the same time, it is within the European Union. And um, to make a long story short, well, now Medusa is the biggest independent media outlet in Russia. Um, so Amazing. yeah, I think number one media for young people. And we have a combination of different products. Uh, so we have applications, we have website, we have a very super popular Instagram account, which actually works um, autonomously from the uh, um, big editorial uh, team. And um, everything is more or less fine, I would say. Uh, in yeah. our I, I heard, uh, I've, I've heard you interviewed several places and you say that uh, establishing Medusa after uh, Lenta Aru Ru was like uh, a second album, like musicians making a second album. What did you mean by that? Well, that's crazy because Lenta Ru was the major project in our lives um, in 2014. Like it was the, it was really huge. It was twice bigger than Medusa now. It was historically the biggest uh, internet media outlet in Russia. And something magical really happened there. We felt that this is a magical um, thing happens to us when we've been working in Lenta Room and it had um, incredible success. And when we started Medusa, we did not even suppose that it, it is possible not only you know, to repeat this success, but even make something bigger, even make something more important for Russian speaking, um, uh, for Russian speaking media industry. But eventually we did it uh, because Medusa, you know, it changed a lot in how people that speak and, uh, you know, write in Russian do actually do media. Yeah. So um, it is even, you know, it is more important than, than you know, Medusa is more important than, than just Medusa. It is something bigger for these part of the world it sure is and and you know for all of our english speakers out there the english website is great and i love how the tagline is the real Thanks. russia period today <laughs> uh, that's that's great um ben when when did you meet um ivan at what point in your career um well let's see my um 
you know, I, I go to La my, my family is Latvian. My wife is Latvian and my kids are. And so we go there every summer and, you know, there's, and, and I, you know, I find myself looking around for interesting people to hang out with in Riga when I'm there, you know, you visit your in-laws in the suburbs as one does. Um, and I can't actually remember who introduced us, but I somehow made some excuse to come find you guys and visited them. And it, back then it was all these sort of Muscovites who had just left, um, just left Moscow and Riga. It's not exactly the Santa Fe of the United States uh, of Russia, but it's or of the of the sort of former Soviet Union. But it's like it's like a really nice city. But they were all just like losing their minds at how slow everything was and bore in boring. And they were just all standing out there, kind of smoking their cigarettes and complaining about how they were stuck in this faraway city when they wanted to be in Moscow. And then over time, they've all sort of become like you know they love it there and it's so quiet and nice and all those things. So you were the editor of BuzzFeed News when you two met, would that be right? Yeah, I think so. Well, and there seems to be such synergy between these two organizations, the way you ran it, the way that, that Ivan runs Medusa. I mean, were you, did you two talk about that? Like, whoa, we kind of tried well, to do the same Well, it was thing, more or? like, I mean, I was like, you know, at BuzzFeed, we did a lot of cool stuff. We also had, you know, enormous venture capital backing and were, you know, took all this investment so that we could build this business. and. What kind of blew me away was, and this is true of Medusa, and also I think of a number of you know journalists, a lot of journalists who are working around the world with way less resources and less legal protection than places like BuzzFeed, had built something, you know, technically similar and incredibly impressive on like a on, on a total shoestring, a but shoestring, all and, and yeah. you know like, but we're doing, you know, had we built made these huge podcasts, or had had this really slick app that also had a little switch that you could flick if you were in Uzbekistan and they were blocking you, you could go to a mirror site. It was just like technically very, so it was doing good journalism, but it was also, had obviously been watching and copying and improving stuff that was happening in the US at like a very fast rate in the way you can do when you're small and independent and have smart developers around. Right, right. And I saw um, they you actually interviewed Yvonne, um, for BuzzFeed News. I guess you had a podcast series for a while. You can no longer hear the podcast, but as the internet never forgets anything, I was actually able to read the interview that you did with Yvonne. I think it was in 2017. And um, you, you, the two of you had a very interesting conversation about independence, which I think is so tied into the theme of, of, of our session. Um, you know, maybe if, Yvonne, you want to tell us what do you mean you, you've said, I think you've said here today that, that Medusa is independent. What do you mean by that? What, how, what is independent journalism to you? Well, um, this is uh, one of the fundamental and super complicated questions you can ever ask any journalist on earth. So I would say that from my perspective, it means that you, well, um, first, Thing that comes in my mind is that uh, Medusa is a private company. It is super important for this part of the world. We are not state-owned or oligarchs-owned or um, public uh, service. We are the private company, and it is a rare situation when a, when 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 a, when the private company, which is owned by the private people, um, and not by huge, you know entrepreneurs uh, become successful. This is the one of the key, you know, um, conditions for independence. Plus we are making money, which is also a very, very rare situation for this part of the world, for media in this part of the world. Any part but, of the world. <laughs> I, I, I agree, yeah, but especially here, especially here, you know. And um, uh, and then we have um, uh, you know independent editorial policy. It means that uh, there is the editorial team, and that's it. Nobody can, no one actually can in, uh, do anything with this editorial team. Neither Russian politicians, both you know um, oppositional and mainstream politicians, nor business, big business, nor um, Latvian government, nor anyone else. Right. Yeah, I, uh, I heard an interview with you and Galino, I think it was with the Atlantic, your old, your former, well, your current boss, right? She's the publisher, uh, well, she's Atlanta. The publisher, but yeah, she, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. she said um, that at that, that time, like 75% of your income was from advertising. Is that still about right? You have... 
I would say more. More? Now it more, is more. more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Of course, well, I want to push back on one thing. In the U.S., sometimes we might say, well, wait a minute. If you're paid for by advertisers, aren't you sort of beholden to them? Don't they, you know, do you, have you ever felt any commercial pressure from advertisers? Like, I, she ran off a very impressive list of all of the organizations that advertise, businesses that advertise. Do, you don't feel pressure from them. Yeah, you know, from time to time, yes, of course, I think it happens everywhere, but especially in, on Russian market, you know, there is this uh, very popular um, uh, Russian phenomena, media phenomena, which is called ban for sheet. I'm sorry, pardon my French. You know, it means like when the company has the, um, uh, makes advertising on some media platform, on some media, in, in some media, they also buy not only advertising, but they also buy in the, that the, the editorial team is, is not gonna uh, publish negative uh, news articles about this company. This is a very common um, story for Russian media market. So sometimes from time to time, some companies come to Medusa and they say, you know, we have these, you know, shit band uh, in Commerçant or anywhere else. Why wouldn't we do that in uh, Medusa? Why wouldn't we establish that in Medusa? But it, it is, you know, it is more funny than anything else because, you know, when you say, no, we're not going to do that, you always feel proud of yourself, of yourself, and you feel that, you know, you're a real journalist with, and, and you're working in a good place with good standards. So I can't say that it's, you know, it's a huge pressure. Well, the clients, the commercial companies are not the you know, the ones who actually oppress media in, sure. in Russia. Although I've been interested, I know a lot about media in Malaysia, and I know that Malaysia Kini, a very independent uh, news organization, they sometimes have problems because um, they are seen as so, um, as so independent um, that sometimes big companies like banks are a little bit nervous about being too associated with them. Or, do you have that problem? Are there big Russian companies that say, you know, we don't, we don't want to be, do you have that too? But the, yeah, absolutely. Okay. There, are, there are many companies, uh, you know, especially close to the state or even state controlled companies because there is a huge part of the state capitalism in Russia. There is a huge sector of the state capitalism and they can't advertise, uh, right. Um, and they can't work with us. You know, we are blacklisted in these companies. But uh, at the same time, we can freely work, we can freely operate with many other, even state-owned companies. But we're not going to work with all of them from our side because, of course, there are really bad guys in uh, among these companies. For example, there is this famous Russian oil company, which is called Rosneft. It is famous, internationally famous. And it is also famous on Russian media market because they are always trying to sue the uh, newspapers. They, 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 they are just, they lawyers work all permanently and they're trying to sue every person mm -hmm. in, in the country who is trying to cover independently uh, their activities. So one day they came to Medusa and they wanted to advertise and we said no, because you are people you are the instrument of, you know, manipulating the media market. I want to move, uh, I'm going to ask Ben something, but I have one last question for you along these same lines. How, what is different, how is Medusa different from opposition media in Russia? I mean, I, I've read, you've sometimes referred to opposition media. I've read other references. Is it the same thing? What's, what, what makes, what is opposition media in Russia and, and how are you, either alike or not alike it? Well, this is, a, again, this is another fundamental question. It is super important. Of course, many people think uh, that we percept Medusa as an oppositional media and comparing with many other Russian media, we are rather oppositional. Uh, I don't like this definition. And uh, this is actually, uh, this is a topic which is really close to what we were going to talk about today here, I think. Because, you know, um, um, it's hard to answer very quickly, but uh, I'll try. You know, when we started in 2014, it was the first time in, in uh, my biography, for example, when I really became the character in, in, uh, uh, in the news. 
and the whole team was the you know we were the heroes the heroes of the um, you know um, of these events and when we started a lot of people thought that we are you know we were fired from Lenta because of all we went we went away from Len we went away from Lenta because of our you know uh, because of political events because it happened when just before the Crimea annexation and many people thought that we are the political actors that that we're gonna join the opposition and we're gonna fight uh, the regime and uh, we're gonna use all our power to you know to. Um, uh to to put pressure on the government to put pressure on putin and the united russia and uh when we started in 20 and uh, 2014 we repeated it in every interview that we're not gonna work as a good propaganda you know we're not gonna um, we are not the part of the opposition but i'm i'm pretty sure that people did not um like us because of our professional standards or because of our professional principles because you know they they um, preferred to think that we are the part of the political landscape and we are the part of the oppositional, um, you know, oppositional group. So, um, but uh, what is super important for Medusa, what is in the core of our editorial team and uh, of our editorial work that we are not, uh, we are, we try not to be involved into the a political process. We are not fighting for the power. This is super important for us. So that's why we have very difficult uh, relations with the uh, uh, positional leaders in Russia, because we put a lot of criticism towards them, the same as we do actually with the authorities. And uh, of course, it frustrates uh, many people. And of course, many people are disappointed that we are not that oppositional as they wanted us to be. That seems to know. be such a, an occupational hazard. They say the same thing at Malaysia Kini that everyone just assumes because they're independent, they must be part of the opposition because they're not pro-government. And uh, one time I heard a, a, a friend who's an Here editor at Tempo in Indonesia said basically the same thing, that when you're in a, working in a corrupted situation, being independent looks oppositional. But you said something really interesting, Ivan, which I want to ask and take over to Ben. You said back in your interview with Ben some years ago, you said, and I think there are outlets in the US now that are in some ways acting like traditional opposition media. I mean, it's dangerous because you put your goals ahead of what you actually know. And um, I thought, wow, that's a brilliant quote. It's dangerous because, you're, because you put your goals ahead of what you actually know. Ben, is that happening here in the US now? Are, are journalists putting their goals ahead of what they actually know? Um, I mean, I think at times. I mean, you know, I think it's, that, that is such a great line. And I think you, um, yeah. And I think the, you know, Trump created a situation where on one hand to do straightforward journalism looked oppositional, like you were saying, as it does in, in Russia or it does in Malaysia. Um, and where Trump really specifically, even more than the leaders of those countries, called the journalists the opposition, tried to position the journalists the opposition, his core of his politics was complaining about the media. It wasn't like some side thing. It was the main thing he does and the main way that he you know, draws attention to himself and makes people like him. Um, and so I think the media had to sort of work extra hard to stay off the ballot. And I think particularly cable news, and, you know, I think if you watch CNN, you know, the thing that was doing best for them was rating best for them was having their anchors deliver monologues about how terrible Donald Trump was, which I don't, you know, it's not informational. I mean, it does feel very much like a, like a sort of political opposition function, although they also did a lot of great journalism and found true facts. I mean, I think, you know, there was also a lot of, there was, there was a lot, I mean, the Trump Russia story is such a big sprawling, messy thing, a lot of which is real. But there was certainly reporting on Trump and Russia that jumped to conclusions that weren't there. And, you know, and there were particularly on social media and sometimes on cable news, just sort of wild fantasies also of what, what we knew. Um, yeah, that were, that, again, I'm not sure what they were, but they weren't great journalism. Yeah, yeah the, um, it's funny. I think that when Sandy set up this panel, I think he was sort of assuming there would be a, a, a pro and con between the two of you. I think, 
But actually, huh. upon yeah, reading, I think we agree on a lot of stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Upon I mean, reading Yvonne your column, attack me for, maybe Yvonne will attack me for publishing the dossier. I don't know. Well, I was going to get to the. I was going to get to that because I think both of you have definitely pushed the envelope at points in your career. But I'm I, I'm now read. First of all, if if you are not people in the audience, if you are not reading Ben's media equation column, start reading it. It is fantastic, and and it really is. And you do so much reporting, and every one of these columns just has these little gems in them and they're really terrific. But I see, I thought of you as kind of an iconoclast, you know, you're doing all this stuff at Buzzfeed News that no one else is doing. And now in some ways I see you as upholding these fundamental principles as the world is going crazy. And maybe it's like, you know, maybe it's I like what Yvonne does. I don't know, I mean- Don't give me too much credit. I'm not well, that into fundamental I mean, principles. I don't know you're having any influence, but but the, the patterns that I see in the things that you've written, I mean, I, um, one of your, I'm not telling you anything, but one of his most famous columns was the Ronan Farrow column in which you kind of eviscerate him as, uh, and you talk about the weakness of a kind of resistance journalism. And you say, if reporters swim ably along with the tides of social media and produce damaging reporting about public figures most disliked by the loudest voices, the old rules of fairness and open-mindedness can seem more like impediments than essential journalistic imperatives. And I see you as like going on repeated, repeatedly talking about the old rules of fairness and open-mindedness. And like, again, like not letting the goals get ahead of the, what you actually know. Have you become, I guess I'm curious, have you become, you're like, I see you now as like a defender of, of good journalism in a way you maybe were not seen that way at Buzzfeed. Yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to, like, I, I, I mean, I think that I really see myself as a reporter, and I'm trying to sort of tell stories and unearth stuff, but I'm not, I, I really resist the, there's a big impulse, particularly when you work at a place like the New York Times, just to like wag your finger at people all day, and when you write about media, and I think it's a complicated business, it was always a disaster, you know, the sort of great, the, the good old days were terrible, um, people always made horrible mistakes and covered things up, and deferred to power in embarrassing ways. And I think like, I both am less, I think I'm less sanguine about the past and less um, eager to criticize what people are doing now. Like I think, you know, and, and honestly, whenever I write a story about somebody screwing something up, which I do fairly often, I feel like there, but for the grace of God, go I. I mean, you know, these are all sort of traps that it's easy to fall into. Right, but I, I do think, and um, I, I feel like you've called it out here, not just with, with him, but you, repeatedly you do, the, and it's the same thing that Yvonne was talking about, the idea that, as you say, reporting about public figures who are most disliked by the loudest voices, the old rules of fairness and open-mindedness just go out. I mean, and I, you know, I have a confession, I don't have a television, I've been staying with friends, I've been watching CNN, and I'm kind of, kind of surprised about this, I hadn't realized quite how much of television reporting is just repeating all the things about the people we don't like and over and over and over and over again. And um, yeah, I don't know what they're gonna do. Like I literally, I'm not sure what yeah. they're gonna do now. Yeah. Well, the other thing, um, and I think some of my narrative journalism students are watching this. I hope they are, they're, they get credit if they do. But I love how you, you did one column where you talked about sort of new journalism on the sly, how this is a way well, you tell us what, what, how can, how does this sort of emphasis on narrative and storytelling, how is that, how is it having maybe unintended consequences or maybe very much intended consequences? Um, well, I guess, um, I mean, I think, you know, it's always, people have always wanted to tell good stories. It's always been a trap in journalism. It's always been a goal to tell a great story, but also a temptation to make your story a little too good and to sort of look away from the things that maybe make you a little nervous about the clarity of the narrative or, you know, or actively falsify things in the worst cases. And I think, you know, that the, these big, you know, that, that the internet has sort of made, you know, fewer and fewer people are experiencing something like the New York Times as a bundle of information delivered once a day on their doorstep, giving them an update on the world and more and more experiencing it as a single article that has like punched into their world because somebody shared it with them and is so gripping and compelling that read it 
or by the way, as a narrative podcast, as a television show, you know, as something you could sell the movie rights to. And so, I mean, it's not like narrative journalism is new, right? Like, you know, the new right. journalism of the of the 60s was in some ways where it starts in America, although really before that. Or even before. And by the way, it's not like narrative journalists making stuff up is new. Um, right. I mean, there was this incredible thing in the, I think it was the mid 80s where a New York, a New Yorker art reporter got caught like combining characters. Yeah, he said, yeah. oh no, that's what we do. We made a composite to make the Joseph story Joseph Mitchell better. did that and his work is great. It's wonderful reading. Right. But once, so I tell those kids, once you, once they catch you combining characters, then we don't know what to believe anymore. So you're-, you're Right, you're or, or I don't know, or maybe his audience was a little more in on the joke than the Puritans are now, right? But I think the, the yeah, the temptation of narrative is always to sort of, and also sometimes to go with the easy story and the story everybody already believes and wants to believe. Like, right. I think often the best narrative journalism now, like really the best narrative journalism is, um, like there's a great story by Ellen Berry in the New York Times maybe a year ago about this um, prince living in a jungle in India who'd been living alone in this jungle oh, for Lord, years, very great. remote and, and journal and people had been, occasionally journalists would go and visit him and write about him. And she figured out that he was a con man, not a prince, who had been getting these journalists to write about him for years. And that the real story was how he had maintained this, like why had invented himself as a fake prince and maintained this wild story and used the media to do it. And like, that's the great narrative, right? Not the thing that, that kind of plays to your, not, not, not that plays to your prejudices. Right. And you actually gave a couple of examples, which I won't, I've got them here, but I won't find them, where, where it was like, looking at the expression on someone's face was, you know, that, that, that seemed to prove something. Whereas, you know, there wasn't reporting behind it. It was just like, you know, and then he scowled and looked away, which would of course mean he's guilty, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Either. It's, it's, a, sort it's of, a sort of, sort of narrative lazy. putting your thumb on the scale. Yeah. 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 So I, I so I guess, I mean, I, I do think it's interesting that um, someone that we thought of as being, you know, the, the guy who, who published the Steele dossier, no relation, of course, to me, um, that, that, that you are now, in some ways, like it or not, sort of upholding, upholding the standards or... Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I really resist seeing myself that way. I also do think, and this is like, a, I guess, a controversial opinion, but that consistency is overrated. And that <laughs> if your goal as a journalist is to be consistent, and, that, and to prove yourself right, to say whatever you wrote last, the most important thing about the next story is that it proves you correct. That's its own really dangerous form of bias. And you're just gonna go out looking for evidence that the last thing you said is correct. So right. like in principle, I don't care if I'm consistent yeah. and I'm well, not I'm gonna not, sort of I'm try to defend that. my I, consistency. Yeah. But also, but also I, I, you know, I'm a person from the internet. I thought that, I mean, that we wrote of the Steele dossier that it was an unfair, unverified dossier of allegations compiled by a Western intelligence professional that had been briefed to two presidents of the United States and was at the center of this very heated political fight. Um, and that was all true in the most kind of straightforward old fashioned newspaper way. And the question of, do you let your, your readers see the underlying documents you're writing about or do you just do as sort of CNN had done that day, say, we have this very secret document. It's so damaging to the president. It contains all sorts of allegations, but it's so sort of dangerous and scary that we're not going to show it to you. We're just going to play sinister music and talk about it. Like right. that doesn't make any sense right. to me. Right. And, you know, actually, if any, any people who are watching this are interested, you wrote a great column on October 25th called The Gatekeeper's Return in which you write about the Wall Street Journal's, I would argue, wise decision not to jump, um, you know, onto the, what, the laptop, the, all that crazy stuff involving Biden gate, which never became Biden gate. And you wrote, but I admit, I feel deep ambivalence about this revenge of the gatekeepers. I spent my career before arriving at the Times in March on the other side of the gate, lobbing information past it to the very online audience who I presumed had already seen the leak or the rumor and seeing my job as helping to guide that audience through the thicket, not to close their eyes to it. So I don't, it all, I don't mean at all to be saying, oh, now you're like this stodgy old establishment guy. But what's so interesting about reading your columns is that, you know, you have a handful of people I know actually are wrestling with these issues. You know, that some of the truisms we thought, well, th th it's really fun to read. A, I mean, every single one of these is just fascinating.
Um, well, do you have any questions for Yvonne and vice versa? Because I feel like in a way I'm kind of like in, literally in the middle of this party here and the two of you know each other and are there things that have come up in this conversation you'd like to ask each other about? Uh -huh. I do think I'm interested, Yvonne, in whether it's getting better or worse. Like, what, you know, what is, ha like, you know, I don't know, I read a story in the New York Post that Putin was about to resign, but, um, <laughs> but information in Russia is coming out of Russia seems to be getting harder and harder to come by, actually. And I'm curious if you're seeing it getting better, if it's getting worse, if it's staying about the same. Well, um, you know, it's hard to say it. it I would say it remains um, consistent. <laughs> um, so, um, well, it depends. Uh, from the perspective of a journalist or an editor, the uh, it's not getting better. It's not getting better at all. And um, I would say that last five or six years uh, or seven years uh, were the most difficult comparing to the previous periods. After the Crimea, I think everything was really crazy. Everything is a mess in Russia. And, um, and the media is also a mess. You know, the, the media landscape is getting worse and worse. You know, I, um, I really love your, I really love your work as well as many people who hear us and uh, I love your uh, columns. And of course, I like this, um, your uh, idea about resistance journalism in, um, as a phenomenon of Trump's era. But, uh, you know, um, a lot of the same stuff boosted here in Russia uh, by Putin and uh, the United uh, Russia Party. And, um, you know, hating Putin and uh, regime is a lot of, it is a mainstream uh, in, Ru in Russia, just like supporting Putin is a ma mainstream idea in Russia. Because Russia is, uh, Russian society is also super polarized, just like American. And um, so there is a huge, I would say, demand of, uh, for, um, as you call it, damaging reports uh, about Putin, his family, his circle, his friends, and uh, United Russia, United Russia Party, and so on. So, you know, that uh, many Russian, uh, many Russian media outlets use this situation to, to, you know, to grow their audiences. Um, just a v the best example, you know, this guy, Alexei Navalny, who is the main oppositional leader in uh, Russia, he was poisoned and, uh, but somehow surprisingly he survived. And um, so he uses it as a political tool. You know, he is, he is publishing his own investigations. He's actually acting like a small media, actually not very small, as a huge media already. So his, his investigations are powerful. They are passionate, brilliantly performed. And, um, and they exist only in this dimension where Putin is an absolute evil. And uh, this is exactly what Navalny's audience wants to hear. And uh, of course, you won't be surprised to know that many of his investigations were, have doubtful evidence and um, methods. And of course, extremely biased, but this, it works. And um, this is the, the kind of environment we actually exist in right now. And it becomes even, even more tough and tough every year, I would say. Because, well, I have a, yeah, yeah, Janet. I have a question for both of you about this. I mean, you just, if we think of Putin as an absolute evil and we think when the president of the United States is lying, that's a lie. And when, how can a person, if we look at Black Lives Matter, how can we say, oh yeah, well, I'm opposed to racial justice. And I think this has been a problem, certainly in American newsrooms, there's been huge division about what, you know, if it, what is, how do you cover both sides of racial injustice or white supremacy? And so um, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on that, Ben? And just in terms of calling out evil as evil um, is, or can you be independent media and say, yeah, the president is lying and Putin is evil and, and, white, and white supremacists are wrong? I mean, can, is that, or is that casting the question the wrong way? 
Um, I mean, I, I don't think it's casting the question the wrong way. I don't think it's that interesting. Like, do do I care if you think white supremacists are bad? Like, I assume you think white supremacists are bad. It doesn't add like a ton to the conversation if you tell me that. Um, and I think a lot of these arguments over like, will the media say Donald Trump is a racist when he's doing racist stuff? Like I was early to say, sure, say it. But I also don't think the most powerful journalism is this, is, is about saying he's a racist. It's about uncovering secrets about his policies that you didn't know before, about getting leaked emails that between one of his advisors and actual white supremacist groups. It's about like, and, and I just don't think that, um, not that interesting. Like, who cares what you think? Who cares what I think about, you know, whether Trump is a good guy? Like, it's it's just not that interesting. You can, and as opposed to the actual work of reporting. trying to understand what's going on and reporting on what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm, that's my dodge of the question. I think, you know, okay. and I don't, I guess I don't, I don't really care that much if, it, if journalists do it or not. Like, I don't think it's horrible it to been. say I mean, what you think or or sort of reprehensible to hold your cards close to your chest yeah. if you think that's a better reporting strategy. Right. But it has been a discussion in newsrooms though, right? I mean, um, yes. How oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Just and I, think, I guess I think there are sort of, I think there are in some ways two things that are getting conflated. Um, one is these sort of broad and endless and kind of boring questions about objectivity. Like what is objectivity that are like, I don't even- You notice I, I did know. not bring that up or ever- I, I don't know anybody who, you, I don't even know what people talk about. Often when people have that conversation, nobody really knows what anybody else is talking about. And then there's this very specific thing in American newsrooms that American newsrooms have always, want, you know, for years have said they want diversity, specifically they want black journalists. But the deal has been, if you're a black journalist, you are allowed to write about racism or talk about racism or race. Like that's kind of the deal. Like we want black journalists, but we expect you to bite your tongue on this issue. And we right. want diversity, but we expect everybody to think exactly the same. And that's not a fair deal. I mean, that's, I think, inappropriate. And I think that's something that's breaking down specifically. And America's, you know, like legacy of slavery and its issues around race are specific. They're not general, they're not theoretical. And I think, so, I think that in some ways this, this question of black journalists being allowed to write about their experiences and their perceptions of racism and race is sort of sometimes turned into a metaphor for, you know, whether Janet Steele should put in a line that Donald Trump is a liar. I'm not sure they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess it's funny that um, this is a slightly different topic, but it's always concerned me. I know in Malaysia, there has been a sense, well, you know, only Muslims can write about Islam. If you're not Chinese, you certainly can't cover the Malaysian Chinese Association. And I just, I, I just reject that out of hand. I feel like, look, if you're a journalist, you ought to be able to report on anything. And so it's, that's perhaps a, a different topic here. Ivan, I, uh, Ivan, I didn't give you a chance to ask Ben any question. Do you have a question before we go to audience things? Is there anything you'd like to ask yeah. him? Sure, I have a question to Ben. Do you feel happier in New York Times than in BuzzFeed? Sorry for personal. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's funny. When I was at BuzzFeed, um, Jonah Peretti, the founder, and I, he, he always used to say that when we were trying to hire someone, you could tell if they would say yes or no based on are they, are they someone who cares what their friends think about them? or cares what their parents think about them. And if, if, if they care what their parents think, they will go to the Times. If they care what their friends think, they will go to BuzzFeed. And I, I mean, sort of in terms of the brand, like I loved working for BuzzFeed and saying I was from BuzzFeed. I think, I think more than I like working for the Times in that way, just as a personal thing. Um, but I don't, I think, but, and I love BuzzFeed and love the people there. And there's something really special, as you know, about working for people you've hired, who you know, who you're very close to. This is, you know, I'm alone in my house and there's a pandemic. So that's not so fun. Um, you know, the Times has incredible journalists. The thing that I am most grateful for about the Times that I didn't expect is along with having this brilliant editor, I file on like a Friday or a Saturday. And then there's another editor named Phyllis who, like spends a couple of hours on Saturday and she always makes the piece better. She always finds things. It's like an incredible luxury to have these layers of editing. Um, so, and then being a, you know, I love reporting, being a reporter is, you know, the most fun job. So I'm enjoying that. 
Great question and great answer. Um, okay, well now we do have some questions from the audience and I will do my best here to get them all. Um, all right, we, uh, Yvonne, we have a question about um, Medusa, an online platform. Has it been affected by the pandemic? Are, are you um, suffering because of this for advertising, whatever? Yeah, well, just like many other companies, of course, we have some problems with um, earning money, but we also have problems uh, because we are now the pandemic uh, boosted economical crisis, new economical crisis in Russia, and the um, and we are earning money in rubles, and we spent a lot in euro, because we are based in in the European Union and we are based in Latvia. And it means that, you know, we earned less than we supposed to uh, this year. But uh, at the same time, we had more traffic, we had more readers. Just, I think, yeah. like many other good uh, or normal news outlets. Did, uh, there was another question from the same uh, same person, Yvonne Oh, She asked um, uh, about your, your, the demographic of your, your readers. Are they, uh, in the past, you've said they were very young. Is that still true? Like. How many readers do you have now and sort of who are they? Yeah, this, we have around, uh, I think around 60 to 70% of our readers are under 35, which is a huge number of young people. And uh, we have more men than women, unfortunately, but almost the same amount. Now it is almost the same amount. So the uh, part of the audience, women's part of the audience is growing. And it is uh, uh, actually we we were focused on this audience a lot during last few years, and it is a huge success that we've got more uh, women among among readers. Um, then seventy percent live in in Russia, thirty percent live outside, especially in Ukraine and in Belarus, and uh, but also in the countries where um, you know where huge Russian minorities live like in the sure. state in israel in in germany and in britain so i would say but well, if you look at the top of the cities you, you you'll see moscow number one and saint petersburg number two but number five is going to be london because a lot of russians work in london and uh, i think we are the you know the first media outlet for them yeah um I, I heard galena say something interesting which took me aback she said because they're so young they don't remember the Soviet Union, that Putin is what they remember, that this is, that they are, they are completely different people in some way. That, that's Unfortunately, fascinating. Unfortunately, they also don't remember anything but, but Putin. This is another thing we can say about these people. Mm. You know, it's, it is also a strange perspective, you know, it's a bizarre perspective to your life. Um, but yeah, we think we, we used to say that, you know, these people, these youngsters have good chances to see Russia without Putin. They have better chances than us. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember America without Trump. So, you know, it doesn't take that I long. can't either. I can't either. I can't either. Well, one of the other things that is interesting, the, the parallel between BuzzFeed and Medusa is just how funny Medusa is. And I heard, again, I heard Galena say something that was very interesting. She said, you know, we want people not to be afraid. And when you're laughing, you're not afraid. And I loved that. I thought, boy, you guys are wonderful with these really punchy quips here. Um, ben, you have a question here. Um, this is from Bodie Russell, who says, Ben, as Yvonne was talking about state-owned companies in advertising with Medusa, is there any equivalent that comes to mind that shows up here in the US, the kind of state-owned companies and their undue influence on news? No, I mean, the companies with undue influence are Google and Facebook. Um, which are sort of, you know, oligopoly, whatever you want to call them, whether monopolist or not, are they sort of equivalent of a state-owned company and much more powerful than the state in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, I think, I don't know if they're sponsors of this conference, but they sponsor everything in sight and they- Oh, I know. I don't think and, they and they're are, a major, they And they're a major source of revenue for lots of newsrooms and also a major subject of coverage. and it's really complicated. I mean, I think the basic thing is that the weaker the finances of a newsroom, the more likely they are to be corrupted by that kind of by either advertisers or by these relationships with the platforms. Um, you know, I guess I, I think in the medium term that you're gonna see the, the, the platforms also need the content and need the publishers and by the way, are afraid of the coverage. And I think that hopefully you're gonna see the sort of power dynamic level out a little bit. Like I think, you know, I think 
globally you're starting to see regulators sort of put in market regulations that push the balance of power a bit back toward publishers in Europe and in Australia. And I think, you know, Facebook is starting to pay for content in a straightforward way, um, maybe partly because it wants to buy influence, partly because it's afraid of negative coverage and thinks that might help, partly because it's a way to get ahead of, of government regulations on these issues. Um, but yeah, but I think that's actually the, the place where it bothers me most actually is not in the coverage, but that if you sort of watch television or you read articles and uh, from people who represent themselves as spokespeople for journalism or people write about the future journalism and you read an article that's like half the time the person writing that article is on the payroll of Google or Facebook one way or the other. I agree. I agree. I've been to more conferences, particularly in developing countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, that are sponsored by Google. And the big prize at the end of the tunnel is a big grant from Google to do some project yeah. that will maybe kind of get back some of your revenue that you've lost because everybody's gone to Google. I mean, I, 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 I think it's shameful. I really do. But interesting. Well, we agree on that. That's good. All right. We've got a couple, another question. This one is from Richard Silver. He says, there's always a debate on how to effectively counter disinformation. Common approaches include countering falsehoods with lies, strengthening the independent and well-trained journalists, particularly investigative journalists using data, strengthening civil society so that social fissures are less object, excuse me, less subject to exploitation. Well, I could go on. What advice do you have to US policymakers regarding programs or actions to counter disinformation? So that's the real question. Um, so what advice do you have to those who want to, to counter disinformation? Advice to policymakers. Sorry, I've totally butchered this question. Apologies, Richard. <laughs> I'm not good at looking at questions and the panelists at the same time. So do we have advice to US policymakers regarding programs or actions to counter disinformation? Is this is for me or Yvonne. <laughs> well, I think it's for anyone who will answer it. Well, the other thing is we could all just punt this and save it. I mean, I don't really, next... I guess I would say I don't really want policymakers <laughs> primarily making these decisions. I do think they're, I mean, I think that the main policy question Although like, you know, whenever you see these hearings on Capitol Hill, it's always like, there was this tweet about me that I don't like, why didn't you take it down? But I think that the more sophisticated conversation is around amplification, right? Like the platforms, I don't like the idea of platforms sort of trying, you know, deleting or sort of acting like censors or have AI right. acting like censors. Maybe they should do it to some degree, but it makes me a little nervous. I think what you're seeing right now is, I mean, they have this enormous power to amplify and I think maybe there is a question of, at, do they acquire liability at some point? Maybe they shouldn't be legally, like they shouldn't be legally liable for my tweet. That breaks Twitter, Twitter can't work in that situation. But you know, if my tweet is gonna be seen by a million people, does, does that, is there some threshold where they do acquire liability for distributing it? And could you set that up in terms, really just in the terms that crude, if something is gonna be promoted above a level of X people the platform requires legal liability for it. And there's a special threshold for that. And at that point, they're basically publishing it. Um, I think that's what you're seeing with Trump's nonsense about the election right now is that Facebook, you know, attaches a, attach like this ridiculous little tag to it that says, you know, you might want to see other perspectives. And it doesn't it has very little is marginal act some of that. But the real thing that's happening is it's getting shared. And the thing that you kind of don't want to happen with this information is that it gets shared so widely. And so right you know, is there a way to kind of interfere with these mechanisms or virality? And that is something the platforms think about and worried about. And also, I, I, I do want to say that the session right after this is going to feature Olga Yurkova of Stop Fake. And so we're going to have a whole 45 mm -hmm. minute discussion on uh, disinformation and how what we can do. So I think um, it's a good question, but probably one that we should better toss to Olga when we see her in a few minutes. Oh, there she is. I, um, um, that's the amazing thing about Zoom. Um, I want to ask both of you about um, what seems to me, in each of your cases, you've had this really interesting situation where you publish something that um, a lot of people think you shouldn't have published. And I think most Americans are aware of the Steele dossier and the BuzzFeed News had it, and that was controversial. I think fewer of us are going to be aware of Medusa's big publication, which came out, uh, I guess about, what, about seven months ago? I'm on COVID time, so I get confused, but it was your, 
it yeah. was this story. It was a story about the Penza Network case, um, and and then you and your reporters, Yvonne, found that there was actually a murder involved, and that writing this that these were really popular people who had been who'd been framed by the government on terrorism charges that were completely fraudulent, but you also discovered, I don't know if I'm saying this quite right, you discovered there was a murder that took place too. And you you wrote, published about that, which I gather disappointed a lot of your readers because they thought, you know, any, you know, that you're, what, you're, you're giving sustenance to, to Putin, you know, that you're, 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 you're not being oppositional enough here. Do you, I, I know I butchered that explanation. You can correct me, but have you, what are your thoughts on this now? Or, or do you have any regrets about having published this or, or no? Mm, I have no regrets about publishing this piece, of course, though. So yeah, these people were really, they are really popular. Um, this is a very famous case and it was completely fabricated by FSB against these young people from uh, Penza, which is a small town in central Russia. And they were accused in terroristic actions, though they are basically they are, you know, left anti-fascist uh, activists. Mm -hmm. This is more a sub subcultural thing. And yes, they uh, actually uh, were involved in in double murder. And that was the story. And a lot of people said, especially among, you know, um, liberal part of our uh, audience, they said that we have ruined the uh, public campaign of uh, support to these people. And it is almost impossible to protect them after that, which is basically true because the, these guys, some of them were involved in, a, in a real crimes. Um, I have no doubts about this, um, this story. And, uh, you know, this is your job to public stories that people maybe don't want to hear. And um, I agree. That's why I wondered why you published an editorial that specifically, I mean, did, were you getting a lot of pushback from your readers saying, how dare you do this? Or exactly what, what's the, what was going on behind it? Yeah, it was a huge, it was a huge scandal in Russia. Yeah, it was, it was just enormous uh, scandal around this, this story. So I have, you know, if I could uh, do it, once again, of course, as a, as a, as a more mature person, um, you know, I would do maybe something I would do in a different way. But the core of the story was absolutely right. And it was the right decision. We did the right decision and we had to publish that. Um, so I don't have any regrets. I think it's, it, it is even, for me, it was, um, <laughs> I learned a lot about the way um, journalism actually works. And um, we had a lot of conversations. What I think is, was the most useful about this story is that we had a lot of conversation within the editorial team about the consequences, about the um, responsibilities. And um, I think this uh, conversation about, you know, you can't think about the political consequences because you're going to do something wrong if you think about the political consequences. You know, yes. back in the in the 1980s, when Herbert Gans wrote his famous book, Studying the News, he said he found that jur American journalists, at least American journalists, don't talk, think about consequences. They can't because they'd be paralyzed. You know, you, you, you have to report and you have to. Report. Yeah, yeah, you know, but it's it is especially difficult when you are working in such place as Medusa, which is a very um, big thing for liberals, liberal part of Russian society. Like, um, you feel that you are betraying these people, even if you understand that you're doing everything correct, because this is what they tell you. This is what they throw it to your face. And uh, of course, it's it's difficult. It was a hard. Uh, it was hard for the whole team. I think the same as with the dossier, famous dossier, and Ben. Uh, I am, by the way, I am one of the luckiest person in the world because I know from one side I know Ben who decided to publish it for Americans, and I also know personally a woman who is uh, so-called main 
uh, source of this dossier. I know her. Ivan like, knows everyone. <laughs> I know everyone. Yeah. I, unfortunately, we are just about out of time. Thank you both so much. You're just extraordinary. I would really urge everybody, you know, sign up for Medusa's newsletter. It's great. It comes every day and it, you'll be up on what's going on in Russia and definitely read the media equation. It's really great. And uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to both of you. And I, I know that Sandy gets to have a, the final word here. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Fantastic discussion. Uh, uh, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It's great to see you, Yvonne and, and Jonathan. Thank you, guys. It, I was happy to see you, Ben, and I was happy to see you, Janet. Sandy, I hope to see you next year. <laughs> Less so, Sandy. <laughs> please come. <laughs> All right. Bye, folks. And then everyone else, please stay on the line. We have another little presentation for you right now. Um, from Olga Yurkova. You may recall she came to Journalism Under Fire in 2018. So just while we're getting Olga's screen all set up, I'm going to uh, show us a little video of, uh, from our friends down the street at the Santa Fe New Mexican. So we'll be right back in two minutes with Olga Yurkova.